Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Atome Energy PLC investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time via the Q&A tab that's just situated on the right hand corner of your screen. Please simply type in your questions and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company will review all of the questions submitted today and publish responses where it is appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we will notify you by email when these are ready for your review. Before we begin, I would like to submit the following poll and if you could give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand you over to CEO Olivia Massa. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the time. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody who has joined. Uh, I know many of you are investors uh, in Atom. So thank you very much for your support. And well, I guess the last time we were uh, presenting um, at uh, Investor Meet was around January. So in the past four months, quite a number of things happened. Uh, so I will go into the presentation um, and essentially you know, explaining, obviously, for those who don't really know who we are yet, uh, the story of Atom, but more importantly, sharing the update. So um, Atom, it's, you know, the idea is to invest in uh, the production of green hydrogen and green ammonia, especially. And these are essentially the commodities of the future that we are investing in today. Um, ever since we listed, uh, some of you may remember, we were awarded the Green Economy Mark from the London Stock Exchange. Uh, putting the emphasis that everything we do uh, is indeed green. We also join uh, the UK's Hydrogen Association, uh, but the little logo you see on the left of the presentation, it's the one of the International Fertilizer Association. Um, obviously, uh, ammonia is the basis for fertilizer. Um, this is the equivalent of the uh, International Energy Agency. Um, and for us, the big focus is really around uh, the production of green ammonia from a fertilizer point of view, as well as energy. So you will have the usual disclaimers. Uh, and if I can also please note uh, that the presentation that you are going about to see is available on Atom's website, uh, as well as the analyst report uh, from SP Angel. Uh, so the quick summary, um, it is, you know, we are now fast becoming a world leader in green hydrogen and ammonia uh, because of our strategy around fast track projects uh, with the idea that we'll have first income uh, in early 2023 uh, with our mobility project. Um, obviously, for us, it's all about um, having exposure uh, to uh, the future of green hydrogen and green ammonia on the production side. Um, and clearly with our projects, we are going to have more, uh, more and more uh, news flow coming out uh, as we uh, continue to progress our project. And actually there was a significant prog uh, progress, which we announced two weeks ago, uh, which was the 60 megawatt power purchase agreement uh, with Ande on uh, the Vegeta site, with which we will go um, and discuss a bit later. But this is in addition to the 250 megawatt project that we were discussing earlier. Um, so, of course, the idea is because we have significant power available today, um, we know exactly uh, what is going to be the future price of uh, the electricity we will be using. We, we already have existing infrastructure in place, uh, and this will allow us to take the most advantage of the increasing disconnect that we are seeing in fuel and energy prices, which are rising extremely fast, as well as fertilizer prices, which is causing some really large issues uh, especially around food security. Um, we have also announced uh, about a couple, a couple of months ago that uh, we were starting uh, Atom Mobility, um, which is hydrogen for transport in Paraguay. Um, you know, some of you may not know, but Paraguay is one of the most forward country as far as green energies and as well as greening um, its, uh, its um, transport sector for what is called electromobility. So uh, being able um, to invest quickly uh, into uh, that side of the business uh, was quite key and it will generate first revenue in early 2023. And as uh, you may have seen, we have already contracted ACOM, which is one of the world's largest engineering firm in the world, to help us uh, put uh, this and the engineering together. Um, and of course, it's not just about Paraguay and Iceland, it's about being able to build a, a pipeline of projects and also having a number of uh, options around the monetization of our projects, 
you know, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, working closely with the off-takers who will want to uh, have access to the molecules that we will produce, as well um, as, you know, farming out, farming in into our project. So the investment case, um, again, it's about, you know, we are the first and still the only company listed on the London Stock Exchange, uh, which gives investor exposure on uh, energy and food security and green molecules, uh, which is a market which is fast growing. Um, you already have one company in, on, in the Euronex called Hydrogène de France, which was listed last summer. It's valued at around 400 million uh, euros. There's another company focused on France and Europe, which is currently going through its own IPO in uh, Europe uh, called uh, LIFE. Um, but you know, if you want uh, access uh, in to, to these markets in the UK, we are still the first and only one uh, which will be a producer of green molecule. Um, and it's all, uh, it all is around the access to existing power, cheap power available 24-7 um, and green power, uh, which is even more important today um, some of the you know, less specialists probably not aware of it, but actually today with the uh, issues we are seeing in the um, supply chain, the cost of solar panels and the cost of uh, wind uh, turbines is, is going up, which will increase the cost of uh, future energy, whilst we are relying on existing infrastructure, which have excess power today. Um, we are also technologically agnostic. So if you remember from some of the early presentations, we have the access to three different technologies, which is Alkaline, existing for the past 80 years, PEM, which is where ITM uh, is, which is very um, relevant when you use solar and wind power, uh, but you know, less needed when you look at uh, hydroelectric and geothermal power, which is stable baseload power, and SOEC. Um, we are also importantly situated in um, stable countries, uh, democratic countries which have a domestic large pipeline of future demand. So export markets are great, but the reality is for us, speed of, uh, speed of execution of our project is reasonably sized with existing infrastructure, with an existing market. Um, and of course, um, it wouldn't happen without having a strong management team, uh, which will uh, I will just go over uh, very briefly later. So again, for us, it's fast track. Right? It's all about being realistic. You are probably reading about the need for gigawatt scale of projects like the one uh, in Australia or the ones in Saudi and Qatar. These will absolutely be needed, but it will take you know, nearly the best part of this decade for these projects to get into production. Um, we are offering a proposal which is essentially going to be in production uh, on the mobility hydrogen side in 2023, on the ammonia production side you know, within, 20, uh, within H1 2025. Um, and it's not just about hydrogen and ammonia, it's also about we are producing uh, medical grade oxygen um, and of course we will be generating carbon uh, revenue. And um, you know, when we listed, I think the carbon price uh, was in the low $50 a ton. Today's carbon price uh, is, you know, has a couple of times already uh, breached the $100 a ton of carbon. It is the right thing to do anyways, it's not, uh, it's not just about sustainability, but you know, environmental subsidy, sustainability comes for also financial sustainability and our projects are quickly being recognized as the right way to do it. Um, and uh, we're talking about the 60 megawatt uh, power purchase agreement that we just signed. Again, it doesn't look significant, but actually you have to think that today the largest operating uh, elect green electrolyzer is 20 megawatt. So we're already now in progress to go towards um, uh, front-end engineering and design on, uh, on a project which is three times bigger than the largest electrolyzer in production today. Uh, the uh, management, uh, again, very briefly, we were incubating within, incubated uh, within a, a, an oil company uh, called President Energy, which obviously uh, now we are fully independent from President. Um, we were uh, also created via uh, Peter Levine, our chairman, who has a track record, obviously, of successfully investing and selling energy companies, but more importantly for us, uh, has a long track record around engineering and construction companies. And we are now, now that the PPA is signed, now it's all about execution. You know, in uh, This is still a midstream process. This is a margins game. This is all about producing and construction for as fast as we can, as cheaply as we can, and as efficiently as we can. So that ethos remains uh, within Atom. Uh, 
my background was in engineering, starting uh, delivering uh, power uh, on the power sector, uh, then on the oil and gas sector. And for the past 10 years, I was with the IFC, um, so which is the private investment arm of the World Bank, uh, covering all around um, energy, both from fossil and uh, renewable and all around equity and, and debt. Uh, but more importantly, in a way, it's all about the combination of what we bring. And Jim Spaulding, who is uh, our uh, president in Paraguay, and uh, is really showing that you know being on the ground is the, it is absolutely key. And it is this discussion that the team is having every single day with Andy, the power supplier, with uh, the various uh, government organization to ensure that our, for our projects are on the fast track, will we'll be able to stay ahead of any regulatory issues and also spotting the opportunities like uh, the 60 megawatt uh, power purchase agreement. We also have uh, Myros, who in the same vein has been invaluable for us to be able to have now very advanced discussion uh, with some of the world's largest suppliers of uh, electrolyzer suppliers uh, and as well as uh, the uh, ammonia synthesis loop um, so that we are able to have um, a real line of sight on uh, the uh, supply, on competitive bidding uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, on ensuring that we use the best technology at the best price within the best delivery date. And uh, finally, uh, Sigi, who is the CEO of Green Fuel in Iceland, uh, who very importantly comes from the uh, shipping and fishing side, which for us, the real future and the real upside uh, for Iceland is not only just delivering uh, to, to European markets, but uh, very importantly, um, to take advantage of the shipping uh, market, which is going to switch to use ammonia as a shipping fuel. Um, so hydrogen, you will remember, it was all about, well, now is the right time to, for hydrogen. Well, actually, now is the right time more than ever. Um, it is the, what we are seeing is that since the IPO, um, you know, the price of hydrogen, natural gas, carbon, oil have skyrocketed. Um, so the need to have green hydrogen produced ASAP is more important than ever. Um, clearly, transport is having issues. Uh, we see, obviously, uh, as well, we've had discussion on the uh, uh, on the metal side, uh, where you see a number of uh, smelters worldwide, which are being forced to move towards hydrogen. And of course, and I cannot under uh, sell it, it's really on the food security side. And hydrogen is the basis to be able to produce uh, green ammonia. So the size of the price is huge. Right? It's all about being able to displace 25% uh, of the world's energy by 2050, and we need to start now. Right? Um, it's what is called the $10 trillion uh, market opportunity. And when you put in perspective that today, uh, the total production from green electrolyzers is around 400 megawatts, uh, and we are going to go very quickly into the gigawatts, uh, it gives you a sense of how much work needs to happen, and also how everybody has a role to play, no matter how small, uh, and but more importantly, it has to be quick uh, and done quickly. Um, and I will spend more time on the ammonia side. Um, again, you know, that might not be easy, the easiest to watch on the screen, and you know, please refer back to the PowerPoint on the website. Uh, but we have to remember you know, that to produce ammonia, you essentially take electricity, water that creates hydrogen. With hydrogen, uh, you, you run it through, you run the Haber-Bosch process, which strips nitrogen from the air. You mix hydrogen, nitrogen, you create ammonia. And uh, high, uh, ammonia itself, it's the world's second largest uh, chemical produced in the world. Uh, it is 99% it is based uh, from hydrocarbon, natural gas. Uh, which means that actually its forward price is based on the forward price of natural gas. And whilst when we started um, the, uh, the thesis of Atom uh, uh, nearly two years ago now, uh, the price was under uh, $500 a ton. When we listed, the price was under $750 a ton. And today, uh, the price of ammonia has reached $1,500 a ton. And if you look at the graph, you see on the future uh, price of gas, you see that actually all the way to 2025, it is very easy to see that the price of ammonia itself will remain uh, at or close to $1,000 a ton, assuming nothing else changes from where we are today. Um, and where we are today is obviously the function of what's going on in the economy. 
and what's going on in the supply of energy. And as you remember, we have a push for going green. A number of uh, oil and gas companies have less and less easy access uh, to funding to go after oil and gas exploration, which means that all the time there will be less and less oil and gas available and gas to be able to create ammonia. Um, so that's one side, which is a supply issue. And um, the other side, which is a market issue. Well, ammonia can be used in a multitude of ways. Up until today, it's the largest use of ammonia has been in fertilizer. But ammonia can also be used for transporting hydrogen because what you need to do to transport hydrogen of a long distance is you need to transform hydrogen into ammonia, which is a better molecule to manage. It's also more energy dense. And then you would go over the very long distances and at destination, you transform it back into hydrogen. Uh, it can also be used as an energy source. So we are seeing people like, like Varsila, like Man, working very proactively to transform ammonia to be able to, an engine, a marine engines to be able to use ammonia as a fuel, and as well as on the power side, where a number of uh, power stations in Japan, in particular, are either being dedicated to be running on ammonia, or actually you can act, you can find ways to use ammonia in coal-fired power, power plants to be uh, to reduce the carbon footprint uh, of ammonia. Um, but uh, and so so. You, go, you get into that space where up until now, all of the demand for ammonia was mostly agri, and then suddenly the same molecule is going to have to fight for the transport market, for uh, the energy uh, market. And that means that the need for that molecule will grow bigger, uh, therefore create more tension into the market. So, and now you have a macroeconomic reality, uh, is that we have to remember that 30% of fertilizer supply and crop supply comes from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine. So if suddenly you take out 30% of a supply, which is already quite stretched, you can imagine that the need to diversify the source of ammonia uh, becomes quite important. So again, it's not just about being green, it's about being able to supply uh, molecules which are actively needed not only for energy security, but also for food security. So for us, it's all about being able to deliver these projects quickly. And you know, you will remember from our presentation, the Paraguay projects where why does, why is Paraguay an interesting and actually the best place is this is the Itaipu Dam. It's the second largest hydroelectric dam in the world, jointly owned between uh, Brazil and Paraguay. Uh, and it means that actually you have a large amount of excess power available today in Paraguay and to be able to use, uh, to produce green molecule. Um, if you look on the top left of the picture, you see Brazil. And as we were talking about food security and access to fertilizer, Brazil is the world's largest importer of fertilizers. That's one thing. The other side is Brazil single largest provider of uh, fertilizer is Russia. So you can imagine the tension that you have in a country where, uh, which is in desperate need for fertilizer. And Paraguay itself is the fourth largest exporter of soybeans, so a very large agricultural uh, country uh, by itself. So um, it's all about finding ways to use that energy that you have in the country uh, and to benefit to have domestic molecules create domestic electrons because a import bill of fertilizer, which was just under $500 million uh, in Paraguay in 2019, is fast approaching $2 billion. So it's, it's a clear need to, keep, to be able to keep uh, the economy of Paraguay competitive, to keep the, the, the cost of food low, but also to, to be able to export um, in, in, in its neighboring countries. From a risk point of view, on a credit risk point of view, actually Paraguay is a very stable country. It has, uh, it has weathered the COVID storm very well. And actually it has improved uh, its Fitch and SAP rating. It's now rated at double uh, B plus. Um, and from a macroeconomic point of view, as far as the country, they have clear climate commitments. Um, you know, they, they already one of the greenest countries in the world from the energy generation side, but they need to green agriculture, they need to green transport. So they understand that uh, it's uh, they they are fully aligned with what we are trying to do uh, therefore they are fully aligned in us trying to accelerate our projects um, which is why Vegeta came and if when you look at this picture um, and you see uh, the bottom right 
this Vegeta is actually uh, the site of uh, you know an industrial port uh, in uh, about 30 kilometers south of Asuncion, the capital. It is one of the ports where you have it's a where you have an industrial complex when you have some of the largest largest um, uh, fertilizer and uh, cement uh, companies in the country, which import and export goods from. Um, so it means that for us, again, it's all about being in a place where you have existing infrastructure. Uh, that we can leverage so that we reduce the risk on risk and that we only have to take care of building the electrolyzer and uh, the ammonia loop and then obviously some storage. Um, where today, uh, there, where was this, this on the bottom right, the 100 megawatt substation, which was recently commissioned by Ande, uh, when uh, they approached uh, Jim and the team, you know, they expressed that they had just built this and they had about 60 megawatt of excess capacity and asked if we would be interested because it was really at the heart of our clients and obviously clients for the domestic market. But if you look at uh, the little map of uh, South America, you see that because it's on the Paraguay River, you also have access to export routes, um, which enables us then you know, to sell it to Brazil or if we go into much larger quantities in the future, um, then to go uh, to go ahead some of the uh, European or Asian markets, uh, which are again would be competing worldwide for the uh, molecules. But we need to stress that actually this is one of these things which is it came in. It wasn't part of the original design. You know, for us, uh, we always thought that you know Itaipu phase one, phase two, as we had described, was going to be the first thing coming out, um, and this is still completely on track, uh, but then it is because of our relationship on the ground uh, that the team was able to identify uh, this 60 megawatt for us to pounce on today. Uh, again, you know, 60 megawatt is nothing, it's not small in any sense of the world. It is significant uh, cash flow we'll be able to generate uh, from 2025 onwards. Uh, and it's a great, uh, it's a great way to start. Of course, uh, we still have the uh, Itaipu project, which is uh, which is going, which is ongoing. Where we the discussions around the power purchase agreement you know, are still are still ongoing, and we continue uh, to uh, to progress uh, the project. We were looking at if you remember phase one, 50 megawatt, phase two, 200 megawatt. Uh, now we are saying 50 megawatt plus because we will benefit a lot uh, in our phase one. We will benefit a lot from what we are doing in Vegeta. And, uh, and possibly even uh, look at uh, upgrading phase one if it makes sense uh, at the time. So it's all about uh, having a business which is scalable um, and scalable rapidly. Um, a quick word about, about uh, mobility. Uh, I think for us, uh, it was it came as a request of the government, of course, um, where they saw the uh, import uh, bill of uh, diesel really skyrocket uh, for the entire industry, as well as having to increase the subsidies for diesel substantially. Um, so when you look at a country and you are a government who is trying to figure out how to green and how to help protect energy costs, um, finding a way uh, to use your domestic excess molecules, to, I mean, electrons, to be able to produce uh, energy mo molecule was key. Um, so you are looking at a market for, you know, Asuncion, the capital alone, has over 2,000 buses on the road every single day. You are looking at a country which obviously has trucks on the road every single day, which are uh, trucking in and out, um, you know, the agri agricultural goods that they are uh, producing. Um, so it's all about, you know, being able to be competitive, to be able to be uh, quick. And, and this is actually about also creating markets um, and, and finding the best way to create market at the lowest risk possible, which is why I know we hired ACOM um, as our engineering consultant for the project, uh, and also why we use CPH2 um, as an electrolyzer, which we, we really liked the design of the CPH2 electrolyzer, which had a lot of redundancy built into it, um, which will, for us, you know, ensure that you know, even if you have minor operational issues, you are actually able to overcome them, overcome them quite light. Um, as far as Iceland, you know, obviously Iceland is still uh, is still pr progressing. You know, the 60 megawatt opportunity that we have may look, uh, you know, may look like everybody looks slower now. You know, we are still on track uh, with the 250 megawatt uh, in Itaipu, um, and as well as uh, as Iceland. Um, you have to remember that for um, in this project, obviously, what's happening into the global market is always an issue. Uh, you know, we are looking at what's happening in the supply chain, of course. 
Uh, but as I described earlier for Iceland, you know, the real opportunity for Iceland, it's, you know, access to the EU market, which is the premium market is one thing, but really it's about finding a way um, to help make uh, domestic electrons used for domestic molecules. And the shipping sector is particularly important uh, in Iceland. Um, when uh, you look at uh, ammonia as a solution to shipping, if you look at this uh, on the comparison of uh, shipping fuels, you look at where you are today. Obviously, there's the fossil fuel-based um, heavy fuel oil. That is um, that is what is used, obviously, worldwide. It takes it is easy to store, easy to manage, um, and use all across the value chain. Uh, the world thought 10 years ago that shipping would move to LNG, and actually, it really didn't that progress that much. So it did take some market share, but not a huge amount, which leads three uh, green fuels available. So one of them being methanol, uh, which is lower carbon, which takes twice as much tank volume um, as uh, fuel oil, um, but is able to be stored from an ambient temperature. The problem is methanol still produces carbon when you burn it, so it's not a pure zero carbon fuel. Um, you also have the discussions around uh, full hydrogen shipping. Um, but then the problem with hydrogen, it takes a lot of space in the cargo hold. Uh, and in shipping, you only make money as according to how much you can uh, carry as far as goods. But also, as a temperature level, it needs to be at minus 253 degrees Celsius, uh, which makes it very complicated to manage. Uh, so the only realistic zero carbon fuel that you have, in a way, is really green ammonia. Um, and it's easy to manage. It's minus 33, 34 degrees Celsius, exactly like liquefied petroleum gas. Yes, it takes a bit more, uh, more, more, uh, more volume um, into the tank, but uh, for a number of applications, especially around uh, shipping and fishing in Iceland and all across Europe, if you really want to go zero, uh, ship, zero carbon shipping, green ammonia today is still seen as the, the best way. So we are obviously um, watching very closely at what's happening there. It is a trillion dollar market opportunity uh, for shipping. So as far as Iceland, you know, as we described earlier, you know, we uh, we expect to have a two-phase production. We are looking at a phase one at around 30 megawatt and a phase two at 70 megawatt. We have a number of discussions from the technology side to the offtake side. And actually, as you will have seen, especially in the EU, there's a very fast accelerating push uh, on access to uh, green hydrogen. Uh, so the project still continues uh, and we continue to go ahead towards uh, uh, towards uh, construction and signing the, our first power purchase agreement. Uh, so as far as a summary, so essentially we are very pleased that today we've, we've, we are essentially on track on everything we had promised at IPO and actually we are going a little bit faster when you look at the 60 megawatt uh, project. Um, we will commence production on the mobility side, so early 2023, which means early 2023 cash flow. Uh, but very importantly, it's for us uh, being on the track to get to final investment decision uh, by uh, the end of this year uh, and obviously entering feed uh, this summer. It's all about taking care, taking advantage of this increasing disconnect that we have between the supply of hydrogen and ammonia, and especially ammonia, uh, um, and, and the demand, which is growing much faster than the supply side. Uh, so you can expect over the next uh, few months to see uh, more, uh, more news coming out uh, from Atom. Uh, you will see us appointing an owner's engineer to lead the 60 megawatt project. Uh, you will see us selecting who will be uh, providing uh, the front end engineering and design. And of course, uh, uh, the technology. Um, you will see also an uh, announcement around who will be the off-taker for our first project. Obviously, this is quite important and we, have, we are having live discussion with a number of uh, you know, global traders who are very active in the Latin American market, both uh, for the ammonia as well as the carbon credits. Um, and you may see, obviously, you know, early uh, monetization opportunities as we are seeing increasingly a number of green infrastructure funds uh, of energy companies uh, who, again, are trying to play catch up uh, in, in this game where there is a lot more demand uh, for green ammonia and green hydrogen coming up than there is supply. 
Um, and with this, um, I think I, my presentation has ended and I open the floor for questions. Olivier, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for your presentation this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions just by using the Q&A tab that's situated in the right hand corner of your screen. Uh, but just while Olivier takes a few moments to review those questions submitted already, I would like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed via your investor dashboard. Olivier, as you can see, we've received a number of questions throughout today's presentation. And may I thank all investors for submitting their questions. If I could please just hand back to you to run through that Q&A tab and where it's appropriate to do so if you could read out the question and give your response and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Thank you. Absolutely. So I, mean, I will go through a, a, a couple of questions. I'll, I'll try to go for as many questions as we can. That's also why um, I try to run through the pre presentation quickly. Um, so quite a few around the market. Um, so a question from Adam F. Um, about what is the appetite for uh, potential counterparties for long-term ammonia offtake, and, and how far does uh, the forward market stay liquid? Um, so if you remember, remember on one of the earlier slides about where we see the forward curve uh, of, uh, of ammonia, and, and this is just not us, right? this, is, this is data published by Moody's, by the IFA, by others, uh, about where, uh, where the market is going. Uh, so what, what we are seeing is, and what we are hearing as it's a very, very fast evolving market, um, is we, we have international fertilizer traders, which are rated, you know, A plus, AA, um, which are able to enter into contracts where they will say they will offtake all of your production for the entire length of a project. Um, after that, it's a question of also, can you protect the price uh, as I, you know, create a floor? Uh, on, on how, what is the long-term price they will give you on a very fixed basis. So we are hearing, and I don't, ha I don't have you know, hard evidence on that, this is just discussions we are having in the industry, that there are players today who are actually offering you know, fixed price for the next 10 years and plus for the offtake of ammonia going uh, into the uh, European market. So that's a very obviously a quite a strong signal and, and really showing that it's all about trying to figure out where is going to be the supply in the long term. Just as an example, you know, the crops being, um, you know, being, being uh, grown today and the fertilizer that is being used today actually was ordered two or three years ago. So it's actually already quite a long uh, market. So you have a very active spot market, but you also have a very, very active long market. Uh, the other uh, question on, from Adam was, you know, do we see an opportunity for synthetic e-fuels over the ammonia. So yes, and, and that's the advantage of ammonia and hydrogen is these all can be considered as base chemicals. Um, so I, I've mentioned earlier methanol. Um, you will have seen, you know, Maersk has uh, made some large announcements of, uh, of trying to build um, an ammonia fueled ship fleet uh, actually focused on Asia. Um, you will also have seen that it's actually possible to create e-kerosene um, you need to find carbon uh, to to mix uh, to mix, but it is actually possible. Um, and it, and these things are growing fast. And not only does the International Maritime Organization forcing the shipping industry to green its fuels, uh, but also uh, the uh, aviation industry is also being forced to uh, green its kerosene. Um, there's uh, also we have a you know another question about uh, you know do we that do we think that the Asia renewable hub being built in Australia uh, will have a positive or negative effect on atom? Um, so this is a, in reference to a project which has been uh, incubated and led uh, by uh, Intercontinental, um, where um, there, it, there was a leak uh, a week ago that came out in the press that uh, BP was actually farming into the project uh, ahead of the feed process. Uh, and in that, what was published, uh, again, I'm not, uh, you know, you can look for it online, um, was that the, uh, the, um, the feed will end uh, by 2025 and then start construction to, um, to have production at the end of the decade. So from our point of view, it's really good news, right? It's all about having a larger market coming up um, and, and proving uh, at scale that you have large energy companies who are indeed looking at projects and coming in even before the feed process. So assigning value to like, these projects and when you haven't even gone into feed. 
Um, so what we see is just that you're going to have obviously the acceleration of that move about energy company, green infrastructure funds, looking for opportunities. And you know we are having live discussions with everybody today, right? It's not just about investors. It's about the future it's conversation with future off takers and conversations um, with, uh, with future investors at the SPV, at the project level. Um, and, and the final point I would make also, it gives us some real hard data um, that these gigawatt projects are not going to reach the end of feed before 2025 at best. But at this time, we will already be producing. Um, and we will already starting production and construction on the next set uh, of, on the next phases uh, of ammonia. So I think it puts us in a very, very strong position. Uh, there was a question uh, from Mark uh, on a news flow perspective. What should we expect uh, to hear in the short term? So as I mentioned earlier, owner's engineer um, uh, commencing uh, the feed process, uh, having the discussions and, and contracting uh, the off-taker who will buy on a long-term basis, the ammonia, um, and obviously getting into a final investment decision. And in the meantime, talking about uh, possible financial partnerships, investment partnerships at the project level. Um, let me continue going through the list. So we have a... Uh, uh, so, so we had a question um, about... Uh, trade details for Atom includes a vast number of tiny transactions um, and, uh, and it's assumed that people selling the distribution shares from president, um, but that factor must be uh, long over. And you know, do, uh, do we have a view or do, do our brokers, advisors have a view of why this is happening? Uh, it's, it's very tough to explain. Um, it is, I think it's a great thing for us to see that the liquidity in our stock has increased significantly. Yes, you do have a number of very, very small trades. And at the same time, we see an increasing number of large trades. So I think it's proving the concept that uh, investors are seeing that between uh, the power purchase agreement that we have, between the price of ammonia uh, going up and having a much nearer sight on uh, essentially you know, production targets, liquidity events, uh, is increasing the appetite uh, in, uh, in Atom. Um, we have a question also on uh, how much, whilst the money raised at IPO covers the project, you know, how will they be funded? Um, so indeed, when, when we went uh, and we raised uh, at the money at the IPO, so we were, you know, our target uh, and what we achieved was uh, on the uh, 9 million pounds, it was all about uh, ensuring that we would have enough money to get to final investment decision uh, on the original Iceland and Paraguay projects. And actually, we built a lot of buffer to have uh, to have enough cash all the way till the end of 23, because when we were raising, it was in the middle of Omicron, and we couldn't really predict right, the volatility there. Um, so what we have is actually we have more than enough uh, uh, cash in the bank to get to final investment decision, uh, which is really where the value of a project is crystallized. You know? probably didn't discuss enough about it earlier, uh, but actually signing the power, a long-term power purchase agreement like we have is 70% of a battle, 70. It is really two thirds of the work is already done into having a real project because now it's not a, you know, you know, can we go to FID? Should we go to FID? We already know that we are going to FID. Now what we're trying to figure out is you know, exactly how much, what are the delivery timelines going to, are going to be? and where uh, we can optimize, obviously, not only the cost, uh, but also the sources of financing, because these will be well, these can be financed and will be financed on a structured finance, project finance basis. So we are already discussing with the usual suspects for Paraguay, for example, which will be your, you know, your IDB, your CAF, your World Bank, uh, IFC, uh, which are uh, very focused on investing into green and providing financing for green infrastructures. But also on the lender side, you know, we, you have, uh, you know, the market is quite deep, whether it's uh, Societe Generale, whether it's, it's, it's an Etixis, uh, and in, you know, and some of, even some of the larger investment, you know, investment banks like Goldman Sachs are very active in Latin America to finance these projects. So, um, the other side, of course, and, and as I mentioned earlier and in the previous presentation for us, uh, it's not just about keeping 100% of a project. Is you know, Iceland and Paraguay will have their own SPVs because they attract different categories of investors. 
And this is where for us, it's all about being a developer of project, but an operator of project. So as we reach FID, we will have a number of options, uh, which is obviously reaching to the structured and project finance, reaching to the um, uh, concessional funding that the World Bank and IDBs can offer, uh, reaching also to the traders, because we have a commodity which, which is in high demand today, and a trader which wants our supply for the next 10 to 20 years will obviously you know, try to find the competitive edge within its competition and being able to provide value up front. Um, and of course, more importantly, having these green infrastructure funds who have much more funds, uh, which is allocated to invest at the project basis at relatively low infrastructure IRRs, um, and uh, which then we can bring into the project. But thankfully, because we are a listed company, we have access uh, to investors and to the markets and our value will be recognized as such. Um, so we have a question from James C. How comfortable are you with a relatively immature electrolysis technology? Does that increase overall project risk? So actually, um, because we have access to hydroelectric and geothermal power, this is base load power. So we are able to use alkaline based technology. Um, and alkaline based technology has been existing for nearly 80 years today. And, and it is produced you know, in Europe, in the US, uh, in China as well. So you actually have a wide array of existing electrolyzers, expect, expertise, experience, which have been uh, in operations for a while. On the uh, ammonia loop synthesis, this is a hundred year old process. And actually it's the same synthesis loop that you would use for producing hydrocarbon based ammonia. So actually the bigger you go, the more competitive you get. Um, so for us, we are obviously actively looking at new technologies like SOEC, which isn't yet proven in the tens of megawatt scale, but offers uh, much higher efficiency. So when this becomes available, uh, we will, and well, it is available today, but we still consider it to be a bit on the higher risk side. Um, we will absolutely using it, and especially for the phase two of the Icelandic project, because its ability to convert electrons into molecule being 30% more efficient means 30% more income in uh, the bottom line. Um, we have a question. Uh, so is there an opportunity to scale up Paraguay in Iceland beyond the announced projects and where else in the world are we looking? So is there an opportunity to scale up in Paraguay? Absolutely. Um, you know, there is, if you look at the Paraguay opportunity, you know, this is a country which today only uses less than half of its allocated seven gigawatt uh, power from Itaipu. Um, so there are indeed more opportunities to grow, right? But it's all about making sure that we will build at the right place with the right infrastructure. Um, so for us, it's all about the speed to market and proving to Ande, our partner um, on the power side, that we can build, we can do things fast and we honor what we say we would do so that then the next large and larger contracts will come. Uh, we will be the natural uh, um, partner uh, to go into the next 200, 300 megawatt. Um, when it comes to Iceland, yes, you know, there are a number of power suppliers in Iceland um, that we are talking to. Uh, and there's a big opportunity, which is a bit further out uh, in Iceland, which is, well, once um, once there will be regulation in place to do wind power in Iceland, that is the, really the way when the country could go from producing the tens and the lower hundreds of megawatts of hydrogen into the gigawatt scale. So we are certainly looking at, at it and our, our team in Iceland with green fuel obviously is completely on top of it. Uh, now, are we looking at other places? Of course. It's, you know, we are valued on our projects, but also on our ability to deliver projects and, and a pipeline. And since we've been listed, because we are in a unique position, we've had a lot of incoming from different project developers who, who may not have all of the things, you know, they have, the, they have maybe two or three things right, but another three or five are missing. Um, so we are evaluating these opportunities today. They are increasing. Um, you may have seen, especially in the European context, that a lot of emphasis is going to be put around the uh, supply of green energy from Mediterranean um, renewable energy supply, uh, because it makes you know, total sense to be exporting energy in the form of molecule, rather than trying to build a massive electric cable, um, let's say from Egypt to Europe. 
Um, and of course, the Asian market is extremely, uh, e extremely active. Uh, and we are looking there as well. Um, and it's all about finding exactly what we have today, which is the right people on the ground in the right environment and an ability to deliver projects very quickly. So a, um, we have a question from David M. How do you expect the grant subsidy market for the green hydrogen producers to evolve this decade? Um, well, actually, it is, it is evolving pretty quickly. Um, if, you have, if you are a producer in France uh, and in Europe in general, there's already a fair amount of work being done and the EU uh, is coming up with new uh, guidance later this week. Uh, we have seen in the US, in the uh, first uh, Biden infrastructure uh, plan, a subsidy of up to $3 uh, per kilogram of hydrogen, green hydrogen subsidy. Um, and even in my old shop at the World Bank, you know, we, uh, we were very active in Chile uh, to provide a form of subsidy on the purchase of electrolyzers. The advantage that we have is because we have access to some of the world's cheapest stable power, our requirement for subsidy is, is low to non-existent, uh, but actually, if it is available, we absolutely will use it. Right? That, that, that just wouldn't be responsible from our point of view. And we have projects which are very much aligned uh, with what uh, these institutions are trying to do, not only because it's the right thing to do on the green side, but it's the right thing to do on the energy supply side, and it's the right thing to do uh, on the uh, food security uh, supply side. Trying to find if I missed any question. Um, um, so we have a question um, about uh, you know IOCs, so international oil companies, are diversifying and expanding their green pipeline. Uh, what impact uh, do you see on Atom, uh, and also what stops such competition? from coming and using Paraguay's renewable energy uh, now that you have put it on the map? Um, it's, it's a very fair question. Right? It's, uh, the reality is, I think, Paraguay was underappreciated um, because a lot of the international developers have been focused, we think, on the wrong thing. They were always focused on producing large amount of hydrogen at scale to export. Um, and, and we've seen a little bit of a shift when we're realizing that, you know, you need to create the market, you need to work before you can run. And which is where our strategy of being smaller scale, using the domestic market first, which is a domestic market, which is stable, which has, which is on dollarized economy, uh, was the right thing to do. Um, but what we are seeing, especially from an IOC point of view, and we discussed earlier the Asia uh, Renewable Hub, is you know, if you're an IOC, you're not going to spend a, a lot of amount of time doing the project development. Uh, but once the project gets to FID and you have line of sight to the 100 megawatt, then you let somebody else like us do some of these hard miles, get the project through concept, through proof of concept, through financial, final, final investment decision, through the contracts, and then they would come in, um, obviously at a much higher valuation than what we are, or we would be, um, but it gives them line of sight on near-term large-scale production, which I think, you know, from a use of time and money makes total sense in a, a, an IOC, which may, may not be chasing the higher returns that we are chasing, but is chasing scale. So I think I am pretty much done with the questions now. Um, so unless anything else comes or I have missed anything, let me just go for the chat quickly. No, I think that is it. So Olivier, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for taking the time to address all of those questions that you can this afternoon that have come in from investors. And of course, if there are any further questions submitted today, we'll make these available to you immediately after the presentation has ended for your review. And we'll publish all those responses where it's appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet Company platform. Uh, Olivier, perhaps for redirecting the investors on the call to provide you with their feedback, their thoughts, their expectations. If I could please ask you just for a few closing comments to wrap up with, that'd be great. Thank you. So I think the closing comments is really, well, 
There will be many. So first of all, thank you for uh, the investors who have trusted us. Um, we knew when uh, we were pushing at the IPO time um, that it was, you know, it was seen as uh, as aggressive, and we have delivered. You know, we have delivered on the projects. We have delivered more than what we said we would deliver, and the share price has also delivered. Um, and it's only the beginning. So this is really the thing to expect over the next few months with us. Uh, it's all about going, continuing to prove um, that the value we will be creating over the next uh, month and years uh, is is going to be something that is going to be tangible for investors, tangible for us, um, and um, and watch us very closely as we announce owners, engineer, uh, feed technology uh, partners. Uh, uh, offtake partners and obviously all the way uh, down uh, to final investment decision and not only on, on Vigeta but the other projects. So um, continue to watch us closely. It's going to be very exciting uh, over the next uh, few months and, um, and again it's, it, it's, it's great to be in a position to speak to everyone from a, a very strongly performing not only environment but share price. Olivier, that's great. And thank you very much indeed for taking the time to update investors this afternoon. Could I please ask investors not to close this session as you'll now be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Atom Energy PLC, we would like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. So good afternoon to you all.